I'm Natasha Riga Jones. I'm Amy Preston, and welcome to Warwick Congress Weekly. This week, we'll be talking about the US stock market, the Tasmanian state election, VAR technology for the World Cup in Russia, and Jared Kushner. We'll also have an update on gun control in the US, Brexit, elections in Italy, Angela Merkel's coalition success, and some financial news of the week. We'll be talking about Carl Puigdemont to lead from exile, um, the French embassy in Ouagadougou, Iran detaining women at a football stadium, the Bank of England's regulation of Bitcoin as well. But first, we're going to explain a bit about Warwick Congress, who we are, what we do, and how we do it. Warwick Congress is one of the fastest growing student-run initiatives in the UK, and it aims to unite the disciplines of finance, economics, politics and law into a single platform. To stay up to date with everything we do, sign up for free membership on our website at www.warwickcongress.com. Our hope is that Warwick Congress Weekly can inform our listeners, so if you have any questions, queries or opinions, then do let message in and let us know. You can do so by going to www.radio.warwick.ac.uk and pressing the message tab on the top right corner, or you can tweet us at raw1251am. So our first story of the week is a story that's been uh, developing quite rapidly since last Thursday, and it's President Trump's vow to impose tariffs on steel at 25% and on aluminium at 10%, that's uh, tariff on imports, um, which is, as you can imagine, brought a stiff response from trading partners and criticism from both the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization. So if it's been criticised so much by these organisations. Why has Trump sort of invoked this kind of policy? Well, it's thought that it kind of chimes with his America first policy and um, and the narrative that the US is getting a raw deal in its current trade relations with other countries. And in typical President Trump's style in a tweet on Friday, he said, when a country, in brackets USA, is losing many billions of dollars on trade with virtually every country it does business with, trade wars are good and easy to win. Example, When we are down $100 billion with a certain country and they get cute, don't trade anymore. We win big. It's easy. Um, So the president is using a clause in international trade rules which allows for tariffs for national security reasons. Um, But this move has not totally come out the blue. The Commerce Department recommended tariffs in February after conducting a review under a rarely invoked national security regulations contained in a 1962 trade law Um, And Mr. Trump had already announced tariffs on solar panels and washing machines in January. So how have the European Union responded to this? Because this seems like quite a step back from a potential transatlantic free trade agreement. Yeah. So as you can imagine, they've they've been they've kind of turned their nose up at it. And the EU trade chiefs have reportedly been considering uh, retaliating with a 25 percent tariff um, on around three point five billion dollars or about two, two and a half billion pounds of imports from the U.S., that would target iconic US exports such as Levi's jeans, um, Harley Davidson motorbikes, and bourbon whiskey. Um, and that comes from Jean Claude Juncker. So that's that's like quite high authority in terms of retaliation. I mean, it seems like Trump wouldn't be silent on this response. So how has he responded to these tariffs? So again, in typical Trump fashion, he, he took to Twitter um, and said, if the EU wants to further increase their already massive tariffs and barriers on US companies doing business there, we will simply apply a tax on their cars which freely pour into the US. And he followed, that, he followed that up with, they make it impossible for our cars and more to sell there. Big trade imbalance. A second tweet uh, decried the $800 billion yearly trade deficit because of our very stupid trade deals and policies. And uh, President Trump added that our jobs and wealth are being given to other countries that have taken advantage of us for years. They laugh at what fools our leaders have been. No more. So he's kind of clearly showing his America first colours there and the rest of his Twitter rhetoric on it with hashtag America first and big capital letters kind of kind of shows that. Um, and the US is the largest market for EU car exports, making up 25% of the 192 billion euro or 171 billion pounds worth of motor vehicles um, in 2016, where China was second with 16%. So what about the response from other key players? So the US um, imports roughly $460 billion worth of steel from the EU, Um, but the EU is only its second largest uh, trade import partner for steel, where the largest is Canada. Um, And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada slammed the tariffs as absolutely unacceptable, telling reporters in Ontario that he was confident that we're going to continue to be able to defend the Canadian industry. And with NAFTA uh, negotiations ongoing, this will obviously be a key sticking point for the Canadian delegation. 
And the International Monetary Fund have warned that other countries may follow suit in terms of slapping on their own tariffs, um, which could lead to a rise in protectionism globally. Whilst the WTO uh, director, Roberta Azevedo, said a trade war is in no one's interests. But Trump tweeted in typical Trump fashion a reply, trade wars are good. So we're sort of seeing a rise in sort of trade war rhetoric. I mean, is this something that's sort of unique to Trump or have we seen anything like this before? Yeah, so it's worth noting that the 25% tariff that Trump is proposing on steel imports is actually less than a 30% tariff, temporary tariff, that President George W. Bush rolled out in March 2002 against flat steel products like hot rolled bars and cold finish bars. Um, And Bush also imposed tariffs of as much as 15% on other products found to be harming the domestic steel industry. So those 2002 tariffs were initially meant to phase out entirely within about three years, but they actually ended in late 2003, so in under a year and a half, um, as companies returned to profitability and retaliatory actions loomed from other states. And the restrictions were full of exceptions um, for countries like Canada and Mexico and also for specific products. Um, so with an eye on NAFTA negotiations, that, that's quite key. Um, and various sources cite various effects of, of those tariffs back in 2002 with some saying um, that the tariffs lost hundreds of thousands of jobs, whilst others saying that the opposite is true. So it's an area with a lot of noise, and no one's entirely sure what the effect of those Bush tariffs were. But what's easier to pin down is that the tariffs probably cost the USA uh, some some level of GDP, um, with the US International Trade Commission finding that returns to capital probably fell by $294.3 million dollars, um, and the returns to labor probably fell by $386 million. So even though that could be offset by tariff receipts, um, it's still a fall, although for an economy the size of the US with $19 trillion in value, that is almost a drop in, in a bucket, so to speak. And what has been the effect on trade? So that policy led to a 13.5% reduction in the value of US steel imports in targeted product categories in the year after its implementation, so in 2003 four costing close to $700 million worth of trade relative to the year before. Um, so so that's, that's quite significant, although it is worth noting that that was the desired outcome, which was to reduce imports of steel so that domestic steel industries could recover. Um, but the main reason cited as to why the policies were lifted early wasn't actually the success of those policies. Um, it was um, because of changing macroeconomic conditions that helped the steel industry in the U.S., so a dollar depreciation meant that imports were cheaper for other countries. So demand for U.S. steel increased, particularly from China. So how does this all kind of tie back to President Trump then? So that kind of shows that the the tariffs back then didn't really do much. Um, they kind of weren't in the same. They're not sorry, and they're also not in the same situation now. China has since emerged as a major exporter of steel, holding down steel prices worldwide, and a dollar can't really depreciate much more than it has without a massive, massive shock. Um, But still, the economic fallout may be similar, if not tiny. Um, If President Trump ends up allowing significant exclusions like President Bush did, including imports from NAFTA countries, then the impact may be muted, if not nothing at all. So that's really the big question at the moment. Will there be exclusions and how significant will they be? Um, And we'll keep you updated on that. But as it stands, no exclusions are planned and NAFTA negotiations are coming to an end rapidly. Um, Our second story of the week we head over to Tasmania. Yeah, so um, the Liberal government has won a second term uh, with Pre- Premier Will Hodgson returning to power with more than 50% of the vote um, and a clear majority on the floor of the state's parliament. Um, and Hodgson's Liberal government defeated the opposition, which was the Labour Party, uh, led by Rebecca White, and the Green Party, led by Cassie O'Connor. Um, and for the Liberal government to kind of win a second term is actually quite an achievement, um, given that the Tasmanian sort of state uh, typically tends to lean towards Labour. Um, and Hodgman is actually only the second Liberal Premier to win a majority in consecutive elections. So again, this is quite a big achievement for the party. So why do they win? What were like the key factors in that? Yeah, so I think mostly the sort of government campaign focused heavily on its economic record. Um, And there was a lot of feeling amongst voters that kind of only the incumbent government would be sort of powerful enough to kind of continue this sort of economic success that they've seen. Um, So, for example, Will Hodgman uh, emphasised that his government had been responsible uh, for kickstarting the state's economy, uh, creating around 10,000 jobs, um, as well as cutting unemployment to the second lowest level in the country. So the economy was definitely the biggest factor there. 
Um, but there has been some controversy surrounding the victory. So what's the issue there? Yeah, so previously both Labour and the Greens have accused the Liberals um, of effectively buying seats in Parliament, uh, believing the government's campaign to have been heavily bankrolled by the gaming and hospitality industry, which is obviously a huge accusation. Um, and during her concession speech, uh, Rebecca White alluded to this financial backing um, and she said that Labour lost the most well-resourced campaign in Tasmania's election history. So kind of a thinly veiled criticism there um, whilst the Green leader Cassie O'Connor was sort of more open in her criticism and stated that donation reform was required um, stating never again can we let an election and government be bought um, and obviously the government has declined to say how much it spent during the campaign um, but it has said that donations will be released when the law required them to be so it's all very hush hush at the minute the kind of undertones of maybe potential corruptions or inducements there yeah and that's a theme that we've seen quite heavily over the last decade or maybe even longer with with FIFA the international football governing body and we have news on VAR technology that's to be used in Russia yeah, so Video Assistant Referee Technology, or VAR as it's known, uh, is going to be used in this uh, summer's World Cup in Russia. Um, and this is going to be a defining moment for the new yet controversial technology. So on Saturday, football lawmakers on the International Football Association Board in Zurich unanimously approved for the complete introduction of VAR at top levels of football. So just like a bit of background, how's VAR been been tested so far? How how's it worked? Well, this season VAR has been in a trial period uh, with use in English domestic cup games in the FA and League Cup, uh, but also in Europe, in Germany and Italy. And now top leagues and competitions across Europe and other continents will have to apply to the International Football Association Board to fully implement the system. So officially, the vote for the use of VAR system at the World Cup will be on the 16th of March. Uh, FIFA president Gianno Infantino announced it has been seen as a given that it will be approved. Uh, Infantino in his statement said that VAR is part of football and that we hope and encourage a favourable decision in this respect because we are very positive about VAR. So it's quite a U-turn from FIFA then on the line that they've had over the last few years. But have there been any concerns raised about VAR? Uh, Yeah, so during its trial period, VAR has um, garnered much uh, controversy. Uh, For example, last weekend in an FA Cup game, Tottenham had a goal disallowed wrongly by the system against Rochdale. It was described by pundits as comical and embarrassing. Uh, So this is the most recent in a string of controversies. Um, But at the moment, the Spanish La Liga will start using VAR next season, but the Premier League uh, will not might be quite hard to convince given the problems in England so far with VAR. So controversy is something that may not be too far away from the World Cup in Russia, and controversy is something that hasn't hasn't exactly evaded the the Trump administration. And that's where we'll head back to now, as um, Jared Kushner, who's the son-in-law and senior advisor to President Trump, has had his White House security clearance downgraded. Mr. Kushner had been receiving top-level security briefings. And this news comes as the White House moves to impose greater discipline on access to so-called secrets. Um, Mr. Kushner is married to President Trump's daughter, Ivanka Trump, and had access to the president's daily brief, which is a secret intelligence report, despite his lack of political experience. And he was also tasked with brokering a Middle East peace deal and liaising with Mexico on behalf of the USA. Mr. Kushner had requested more information from the intelligence community than any White House employee not on the National Security Council. So do we know any more about sort of why his security clearance has been downgraded? Well, the reasons as such aren't clear yet, but there is concern amongst the White House about his contact with foreign officials. And there's also suspicion about how his business interests could have impacted US foreign policy. So in spring of 2017, Kushner's family firm received about $30 million from one of Israel's largest financial institutions. Not long afterwards, Kushner made his first visit to uh, Israel uh, with President Trump as the president's official envoy envoy on Middle East peace. So some potential conflicts of interest there. And do we think that Kushner is sort of like the first of many to have downgraded security? Well, according to an NBC News report, um, as of November, more than 130 administration employees were working under temporary security clearances, including Ivanka Trump and White House counsel Don McGahn. General John Kelly, Mr. Trump's chief of staff, said that he would be limiting the number of people with top-level security clearance. 
Um, and it emerged that the president's former staff secretary, Rob Porter, had been able to work with interim security clearance despite allegations of domestic abuse. Mr. Kushner may be the first and one of the most influential individuals to be revealed to have had a security downgrade, but it's quite unlikely that he'll be the last. And as we've said before, Trump is sort of always vocal on these issues. So how has he responded to the downgrading of a family member? So Mr. Trump last month said that um, uh, Mr. Kushner had been treated very unfairly and called him a high quality person, which is quite nice praise, I suppose, to get from your father-in-law. Um, <laughs> but Mr. Trump joked about his son-in-law at their annual dinner in Washington on Saturday. And he said, um, we were late tonight because Jared could not get through security. Um, which is, I guess, quite a nice nice touch to kind of brush over some cracks there. And at the dinner, he also mocked other senior figures, including Vice President Mike Pence and also his wife, Melania. Um, so I guess that's your Trump date for the week, but that's not the end of our US news because we also have an update on gun control in the US for you. Yeah, so over the last weeks, um, we've seen a lot of uproar in protests against the current gun laws in the US. Um, and we're also seeing some responses from um, some companies as well. So BlackRock Inc., the investment management firm, is increasing pressure on companies that make and sell guns. Uh, and this is in light of the Florida school shooting back in February. So BlackRock have said that the, the attack in February requires a response and action from a wide range of entities across both the public and the private sectors. Uh, the company is considering offering investors the chance not to invest in gun firms and is asking those firms how they monitor safe use of weapons. Uh, BlackRock is the largest shareholder in leading gun makers, Sturm, Ruger & Co, and American outdoor brands, formerly Smith & Wesson. So how are other companies joining the protest against current gun laws then? So on top of the protest movement started by the Florida shooting survivors, a, num a growing number of companies have cut ties with America's main gun lobby, the National Rifle Association, or the NRA. So some examples are the, the United and Delta Airlines and rental giants Hertz and Enterprise. Um, these have stopped offering discounts to NRA members. Um, also, we've seen two major retailers uh, announce new restrictions on gun sales. So, for example, Walmart has said it was re raising the minimum age for anyone buying guns or am am ammunition to 21 years. So I can imagine there's been a, a response from the NRA of sort on that. So how do they think it will affect themselves, I guess? Well, they're not showing they're not showing any signs of being worried about these uh, recent attacks at the NRA, um, despite increased pressure on the NRA in the light of the shooting. Um, it hasn't shown any signs of giving in at all. Uh, in fact, the chief executive, Wayne Lapierre, has said opportunists are using the Florida tragedy to expand gun control and abolish U.S. gun rights. So uh, then they're, they're not worried at the moment. No, and I don't think that's something that's going to be going away anytime soon and may even dominate the the midterms that we see later in November. Um, another another thing that's obviously key to Warwick Congress Weekly and something that we've brought you every week since we started um, is Natasha's Brexit update. So, <laughs> Natasha, what have you got for us this yeah, week? Yeah, well, another week, another Brexit update. Um, so, Sinn Féin has called on Theresa May uh, to actually come up with her own solution to the Irish border issue um, after its leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, um, met with the EU's chief negotiator, Michelle Barnier, in Brussels yesterday. Um, and giving an account of her meeting with Barnier, uh, MacDonald said that both she and him agreed um, that there cannot be a withdrawal agreement or an agreement on the future relationship between Britain and the EU until the Irish question is answered. Um, and sources close to the European Commission basically said that the discussion focused upon um, a draft protocol, which was released last week, uh, which specifies keeping Northern Ireland in a common regulatory area within the Republic. Um, and the leader of the DUP, Arlene Foster, is set to meet with Barnier today for a very similar discussion. Um, but it's quite likely to be a very different discussion, um, having previously, with the DUP, um, blocked a deal on the Irish border um, that would have effectively kept the province in the EU single market and customs union. Um, so, yeah, it's probably going to be a very intense meeting. Um, and it will be interesting to see if they can come to sort of some sort of agreement. So there you go. That's your Brexit update for the week. Which Short and is, sweet today. Yeah, and we'll have more for you next week. Um, I feel like we need a jingle for that or something. Um, last night we also had uh, elections in Europe in Italy. Um, so yeah, Amy, what have you got for us? 
Yeah, so the Italians casted their votes on Sunday in the 2018 Italian general election and the results uh, yesterday morning came in as the expected hung parliament with populists. Uh, So the far right have been the big winners here. The Five Star Movement, which is uh, populist and Eurosceptic, won most of the votes with a third, by a third. However, the right wing coalition won most of the seats in parliament. A part of this coalition is the Anti-Immigrant League and it has been endorsed to run the country as part of a right-wing alliance with Berlusconi Forza Italia party. So how long um, do they think it will take to, to, I guess, make a deal to govern? Well, it's expected it'll take a few weeks for a coalition deal to be struck with uh, difficult negotiations to be had, of course. I think that can be expected. Uh, Pundits are expecting that the right-wing alliance will have the best position to form a coalition. However, on Monday, both League leader Matteo Salvini and Far Star Movement leader Luigi Di Maio spoke of their right to run the country. So, I guess, what have been the main concerns and speaking points of the election campaign? Because this is the first time we're covering it. So, I guess for our listeners, what is what have been the key areas of the campaign? So, the campaign have been has been dominated by concerns about immigration and the economy. Um, perhaps something quite co- similar to what we saw a few years ago uh, in the Brexit campaign. Um, so ever since 2013, 600,000 migrants have come from come to Italy from Libya across the Mediterranean. Uh, this has ups- been this has upset many Italians and led to politicians becoming more hardline on the issue. Uh, Berlusconi backed right wing coalition in a very anti immigrant. Uh, it- it, backed by the right, right-wing coalition, is very anti-immigration and has pledged mass deportations. Uh, so this could be an indicator of their success, perhaps. Um, the economy has started to expand, but its GDP remains 5.7% lower than before the global financial crisis. Unemployment still remains high, especially in southern Italy, which is mixed, it is mixed with more immigrants coming to the south rather than the north. Also, around 18 million people are at risk of poverty. So it sounds like this is a, a kind of a, a key, key, I guess, turning point for, for the Italian economy and the Italian political, political system. Yeah, massively. I mean, one of the biggest stories of this election is the rising populist five-star movement, um, which has rallied against cronyism, a huge issue in Italian politics, ever since its inception in 2009. Um, it's also campaigning on introducing a universal basic income. Its winning of 30% in the popular vote shows the rising power of populism in Italy, you could say. Uh, this then strongly contrasts with the coalition of the centre-right Forzia Italia, far-right brothers of Italy, and the anti-immigration league backed by Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, and these are forbidden to run, he's forbidden to run for office until next year for tax fraud conviction. Italy is the fourth largest economy, and with huge gains for populist and far-right parties, this could be a major concern for the EU. So perhaps we could see an EU referendum, very much like the, EQ, uh, the very much like the UK in the future in Italy. So from the EU's fourth largest economy to what I assume is the EU's largest economy <laughs> um, in in Germany. Yeah, so German Chancellor Angela Merkel is set to form her fourth government, um, and she's actually been in power for twelve years. Um, after the opposition party, the Social Democrats, voted in favour of another grand coalition. Um, And we've spoken about this before. There's been a lot of political uncertainty since September. Um, And finally, a vote by 464,000 rank and file members of the Social Democrats um, have voted to join in a grand coalition with Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats. Um, having previously been split on whether to actually form this coalition again uh, due to the fact that kind of the leadership of the Social Democrats was very in favour of joining a coalition, uh, but their radical youth wing was not. So there was a lot of kind of division within the Social Democrats. Um, and Merkel has had to make some concessions in order to kind of guarantee this coalition. Um, so the new finance minister will now be a Social Democrat um, and they also get to decide who will fill the six ministerial roles that are sort of for them uh, before Merkel's expected to be elected to Parliament on the 14th of March. Uh, and on her party's Twitter feed, Merkel stated that she was for- she looked forward to working again with the Social Democrats for the benefit of Germany. 
Um, and however, despite she sort of officially formed her coalition and it sort of ended this political uncertainty, um, she does still face a new set of challenges um, from the Alternative for Germany party, uh, which is kind of rising in popularity in Germany um, and is a far right party, which received 12 percent of the vote uh, in the September elections. And it's actually the largest opposition party in Germany. Um, and it's speculated that this sort of increasing popularity for the Alternative for Germany party um, is a protest vote in response to Merkel's open door refugee policy, uh, which allowed more than a million migrants to enter the country last year. Um, so essentially, whilst Merkel sort of won the battle in terms of getting her coalition, she definitely hasn't won the war um, and faces a lot more difficulties in her coalition. So migration seems like a key issue in, in both those elections and we'll keep you, well, yeah, I guess elections and, and we'll keep you updated on those as, as those stories progress. And something else that we always keep you updated on is your selection of financial news from the past week. Um, and the US, in, in the US, stock index futures have had a mixed start to this week as fears of a trade war rumble on, given the, the news that we brought you earlier about tariff. Um China's National People's Congress has officially kicked off with over 3,000 lawmakers descending on Beijing, where the country's rubber stamp parliament is expected to eliminate the two-term limit for presidency. Um, continuing uh, a campaign to reduce risks in China's financial system, Premier Li uh, also set a target for economic growth for 2018 at about 6.5%, which is a slight recalibration from last year's objective of around 6.5% or higher if possible. So it's a slight change in discourse from Premier Lee there. And if you want more news on that um, on that change in term limits, head to warwickcongress.com because we published an article on that <laughs> on Friday. Um, amid tensions between nations, Russia's Gazprom is cancelling its contracts to supply Ukraine with natural gas after a Stockholm arbitration court order it, ordered it to pay more than $2.5 billion dollars to NAFTA gas, Russia's energy minister said the move poses no immediate threat of natural gas to Europe, but Ukraine's government warned that it could use the supplies as a political weapon, as it has done in the past. The EU will unveil plans this month to tax large global tech companies' revenue at a rate in the 2 to 6% range. French finance minister Bruno Le Maire told Le Journal de Dimanche uh, the proposal aims at increasing the tax bill of firms like Amazon, Google and Facebook, which are accused of rerouting their EU profits to low-tax countries such as Luxembourg and Ireland. And finally, the US Committee on Foreign Investment has ordered Qualcomm to delay today's upcoming shareholder meeting by a month as it investigates whether a proposed takeover by a Singapore-based Broadcom would put national security at risk. Uh, the intervention comes as Qualcomm shareholders were set to vote on whether to replace six of its directors with candidates put forward by Broadcom, which is seeking to force a $142 billion takeover. Um, and Qualcomm shares were down this morning pre-market. Um, a story that we kind of started off our podcast on, it was one of our first articles of War Congress 2018, was about uh, the situation in Catalonia. I think we catchphrase the phrase ongoing situation in Catalonia. Um and I do believe we have another update on Carl's preach demo. Yeah, exactly. So the Catalan leader um, has said that he intends to lead the campaign for independence from exile in Belgium. He is intending to use a new council of the Republic, um, of which he would be the president, to coordinate the drive for an independent Catalonia. He said the council will represent the diversity of Catalonia. So this means he'll invite other parties uh, to contribute and take part. He stressed that the council must have representation from local communities and civic society. Uh, the leader said, we will move from the old system of government to the, uh, for the people to a new system, which is government with the people. So whilst Puigdemont's in exile, who's sort of going to take over the presidency in Catalonia? So on Thursday evening, um, Puigdemont said that he had decided not to continue his bid for the regional presidency. And he actually suggested that Jordi Sanchez, an MP in his Together for Catalonia party, should be the candidate instead. However, this could be quite tricky because Sanchez is currently in a Spanish prison as part of an investigation into alleged sedition and rebellion. Um, when speaking of King Felipe, who has consistently supported the Spanish government, Puigdemont said that the king had excluded the millions of Catalans that voted for independence. Um, so he was quite cr critical of the king, understandably. He said that the king had become the head of state um, of only one part of society. 
And for that reason, the monarchy has lost Catalonia. And has he said any more in terms of living in exile and how he's sort of dealing with that? Yeah, so on living in exile, he said that every day I can speak to my family through technology. I can help my daughters with their homework, but I would not wish the situation on my enemies. He said that it's not human and he's not a criminal. Uh, he has never used violence. Um, and Puigdemont, when asked why he had not chosen political martyrdom in, pris- in prison, um, in comparison to his former vice president, who has actually been in jail since November, he said that he needs to have the freedom of speech and movement, which is not possible in Spain. So if he, remain, if he can lead from Belgium, um, this, this is, is much better in his eyes. He said that I'm psychologically ready for prison, but I want to continue fighting for Catalonia. So that's potentially, I mean, if they, if they were successful long term, another, another piece of the EU that would break apart at least for a minute or two. Um, so I guess that follows on from what we've seen in the Five Star Movement in Italy as well. Um, moving, moving our eyes towards Burkina Faso, where gunmen launched twin attacks on the city of Ouagadougou against both the French embassy and the army headquarters. Uh, Burkina Faso Security Minister Clément Sawadogo said there had also been a suicide car bomb attack at the military HQ that may have intended to target a regional anti-terrorism meeting. I mean, this sounds awful. So can you tell us a bit more in terms of what happened and sort of the casualties that we're facing? Yeah, so witnesses reported seeing armed men getting out of a car and opening fire before heading towards the embassy. And the Ouagadougou mayor told France's Le Monde newspaper that the attackers had shot at the town hall and his office windows were shattered, but gave no further details apart from signalling that it was a jihadist attack. Um, And eight security personnel and eight attackers were killed in the fighting, while 80 people, including civilians, were wounded, according to officials. And do we know any more about sort of why the French embassy was targeted? So since Emmanuel Macron came to power, um, France has been trying to mobilise its former colonies in West Africa and and the United Nations uh, to tackle Islamist militants group which operate uh, in the Sahel region of, of South Sahara. And the French foreign minister said that there was no doubt it was an act of terrorism, although it's not clear who carried out the attack. Uh, the French foreign minister, Mr. Le Drian, said uh, it targeted both the institutions of Burkina Faso because the Burkinabe army headquarters were targeted and, and it also targeted France, which is Burkina Faso's ally in its fight against terrorism, given that it attacked the, the French embassy, which they view as French soil in, in Burkina Faso. And um, there had been speculation for some time of an impending attack in Burkina Faso. And this is the third attack on the country's capital in the past two years, saying that France's attempt to tackle terrorism has been a struggle. But I guess the, the main highlight there is, is um, I guess, maybe domestic rebellion against, against French, potential French rule from, a car, from afar, sorry, from Emmanuel Macron. And um, Iran have kind of been protesting against rule from afar, so to speak, which Tash has an update on. Yeah, so um, Iran, Iran, not Iran, <laughs> Iran has detained 35 women um, for trying to attend a game uh, between Tehran teams uh, Estaklal and Persepolis, um, despite holding tickets. Um, and Iran have stated that they were temporarily held and would be released after the match. Um, FIFA's president Gianni Infantino was also in attendance, along with Iran's sports minister. Um, and an earlier live broadcast of an interview between the pair uh, was taken off of air uh, because a journalist asked them about the ban on female football fans. Um, and in the news conference, Infantino told reporters uh, that political issues between countries around the world should not have an impact on football. Um, and Iran has barred women from attending football games since the Iranian revolution in 1979. Uh, so this kind of isn't a new phenomenon. It's sort of a long time thing, really. And it's also quite ironic given, I think it's Article 5 of the FIFA Charter says that you shouldn't have discrimination in football um, with the FIFA president <laughs> in attendance at the game where there's been discrimination in football. Mm. So I'm quite curious as to what the response has been. Well, a lot of people sort of took to Twitter um, to say that the women should protest against the ban outside of the Azadi Stadium. Um, and women's rights activist Marcy Alignad uh, on Wednesday uh, called on women to attend the match regardless. Um, and a lot of people on Twitter sort of said that it was a basic human right for women to attend the match um, and that sort of 
attending this match would kind of be the best chance to break this kind of taboo. Um, and it is ironic that actually Azadi means freedom uh, in Persian. Uh, so a lot of people have kind of pointed to the hypocrisy of naming your football stadium freedom when you're going to sort of repress women from going. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of quite a controversial issue. Um, and, yeah, it's interesting to see how this will be resolved, if it is, in fact, resolved at all. And, I mean, we did bring you news a few weeks ago of, of Saudi Arabia actually allowing women into mm. into football stadiums. This is kind of an op- the opposite scenario from, from Iran, who are obviously their regional, I guess, not ally, but almost the opposite. I wouldn't want to say enemy. But something. <laughs> we did I mean, write an not, article on it, so yeah. if you want to know more, it's all on Warwick Congress. Well, there you go, WarwickCongress.com for, <laughs> nice more, plug. for more on that. Um and we've also got, I think it's our final story of the day. Um, we have news on Bitcoin, of course, um, and Bitcoin to do with the Bank of England. Yeah, absolutely. So the Bank of England has warned that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency faces a huge regulatory crackdown. Um, I think we're all expecting to see this news coming soon. Uh, so in the Bank of England's view, unregulated cryptocurrencies pose a risk. And so they fail to fulfill their most basic function as money. The governor of Bank of England, Mark Carney, has said in a statement that there was anarchy in the trading of cryptocurrency. Uh, And this is in light of the market growing rapidly without any proper regulation. So as you've sort of said, um, sort of fears about cryptocurrency have been around for a while. Um, So why do you think that this warning has come sort of now? Well, it's come at a a time amid growing efforts worldwide to bring Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies under control of central banks and governments. So I think I think this was expected and I think it's a it's probably coming at a right time, I guess. Um, So there are large fears that this is market manipulation with the value of cryptocurrencies being astronomically overvalued. This has led to consumers losing money unfairly. Um, there are other concerns like money laundering, financing terrorism and drug dealing that um, some of these institutions are getting worried about. Uh, countries like Japan and South Korea have also been contemplating a total ban on cryptocurrency markets. This is due to cryptocurrency thefts in the countries. And how is Bitcoin doing at the moment? Because obviously the value of Bitcoin sort of fluctuates loads. Yeah, at the moment, it's pretty low. Um, Bitcoin is at $11,000 at the moment, which is a far cry from its all-time high of 20000 in the run-up to Christmas. However, it has recovered since the fall after Christmas when it went below $10,000 briefly. Um, so perhaps this is a sign that the bubble is now bursting. Um, but it's also indicative of the ramped-up rhetoric against it from governments and central banks. This statement from the Bank of England may have not have knock on impacts with people selling off their cryptocurrencies at a fast rate with fear of regulation or a complete shutdown. However, we have seen in the news that the Bank of England have been testing ways to um, have have been testing ways to. um, We've seen that the Bank of England have been testing ways to um, keep keep cryptocurrency technologies at the core of the British payment system. And if you want to hear more about Bitcoin, you can read our article on <laughs> workcongress.com slash blog. Um, and here's a, st- a summary of all the stories you've heard today. President Trump has outlined his intention to place a new tariff of 25% on steel imports and 10% on aluminium imports, receiving a significant backlash from international trading partners, the World Bank and the IMF. The Liberal government in Tasmania, headed by Premier Will Hodgson, has won another term. Hodgson has returned to power with more than 50% of the vote and a clear majority, beating both the Labour and Green parties. VAR is set to be used at the World Cup in Russia this summer and rolled out in the top leagues next season, despite growing controversy surrounding the technology. Jared Kushner, the husband of Ivanka Trump and senior advisor to her father, President Trump, has had his security clearance downgraded. This news comes as the White House moves to impose greater discipline on access to secrets. In light of the Florida school shooting, investment management firm BlackRock is increasing pressure on companies that make and sell guns. Other companies in the US are also cutting ties with America's main gun gun lobby, the NRA. Sinn Féin has called upon Theresa May to come up with her own solution to the Irish border issue after meeting with Michel Barnier in Brussels yesterday. The DUP is set to have a similar conversation on the issue of the Irish border today. Italians went to the polls on Sunday and produced a hung parliament with both the Five Star Movement and Right Wing Alliance vying to create a coalition. 
The Social Democrats have ended months of political uncertainty in Germany by agreeing to form a coalition with Angela Merkel and the Christian Democratic Union for the fourth time. Merkel now faces a, a new set of challenges from increasing popularity of the far-right Alternative for Germany party. Catalan leader Carles Puigdemont intends to lead the campaign for independence from his exile in Belgium. He intends to use a new Council of the Republic, of which he would be the president, to coordinate the drive for an independent Catalonia. Both army headquarters and the French embassy have been attacked in the city of Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. At least 16 people, including eight gunmen, have been killed in coordinated attacks, although it is not clear who was behind the attacks. Iran has detained 35 women for trying to attend a game between Tehran teams Estacal and Persepolis despite holding tickets. There has been an uproar on social media before the match for women to protest against the ban outside the Azadi Stadium earlier this week. And the Bank of England released a statement that has, it has sent out a warning to cryptocurrency markets by saying that they face regulatory crackdown. Cryptocurrencies have been associated with fears of money laundering, market manipulation and drug dealing. Becoming a member of Warwick Congress has never been easier. With exclusive interviews, articles and careers events for our members, don't miss out on the benefits that Warwick Congress, Warwick Congress membership can provide. Sign up now at www.warwickcongress.com. You've been listening to Warwick Congress Weekly. Our podcast will be back at the same time next Tuesday.